safeguard to protect this heritage in the terms of reconstruction of the sites, very importantly, the recovery of the affected communities, and this regulation to stop the illicit trafficking of cultural goods. So it's my pleasure to ask, first of all, Giovanni Bocardi to join me on stage. Giovanni is the head of UNESCO's Emergency Preparedness and Response Unit. He's an expert in conservation, particularly at conservation in times of <coughs> conflict and natural disasters. Actually, sir, if I can ask you, I should to sit next to me. There we are. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say to Giovanni, thank you very much, because he's stepped in at short notice, uh, because uh, Lazar Asumo, who many of you may well know, uh, who's the deputy director of UNESCO's Heritage Division, is actually in Iraq at the moment, and uh, involved in a project with the Iraqi authorities on reviving the spirit of <coughs> Mosul. So I'm sure we'll hear about that. Thank you very much. <coughs> it's also my delight to ask uh, Toshiyuko Kono, who is a, the president of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Welcome. Uh, Toshiyuko is also a lawyer by training. He is a professor at Kyushu University and has been involved in many years uh, with UNESCO as a consultant and uh, drafting some of the conventions. So welcome all the way from Japan. Dr. Marcus Hilgert, a little bit of a shorter journey uh, from Germany, is the current director of the Ancient Near East Museum in the Pergamon complex. Uh, Dr. Hilgert wears many, many hats, and he's wearing a hat at the moment uh, coordinating a project in Germany with a national police force called Illicit. It's got a great name, so very uh, memorable, and we'll be hearing about that. And also, uh, of course, you're the director of the Center for Digital Cultural Heritage in Museums, the importance of technology. And last, but certainly not least, Walter Zampieri, who's the head of the Cultural Policy Unit at the European Commission's DG for Education and Culture, responsible for the joint communication on new strategy for international <coughs> cultural relations, preparing a new European agenda for culture and the next generation of programs. And of course, there is the small matter of the 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage. So a very busy man. <laughs> Gentlemen, I am delighted that you've joined us for this uh, discussion. And I think let's first of all look at uh, reconstruction and recovery, and then we'll look at regulation. And the External Action Service was mentioning, of course, that there in the past have been some very successful uh, projects in Mali, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Afghanistan, where your organizations have managed to reconstruct and to help the affected communities uh, recover. So let's go back to uh, the past. And Giovanni, if I can ask, from a UNESCO uh, perspective, uh, perspective. What are the lessons that were learnt from some of those past projects? Thank you, Claire. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the European Commission for having uh, us here. I replaced my director, Lazare Lund, who is in Baghdad today for an important uh, uh, event that he couldn't miss. It was the signing of a $50 million dollar project uh, to rebuild the uh, Al-Nuri Mosque and the uh, Leaning Minaret of uh, Mosul with the funds from the Emirates, which UNESCO will uh, implement in close cooperation with the Iraqi authorities, of course, and many other uh, partners, including Ikro. I see that you are also here. <laughs> and um, uh, you asked what the lessons learned are. So first of all, something that uh, Mr. Mansarvizi has mentioned uh, several times, is the incredible uh, relevance of culture in these uh, situations of uh, trauma, post-trauma, both in relation to conflicts and natural disasters. We have seen uh, time and again how much culture is uh, critical um, in different ways, not always in the positive sense. Sometimes culture is also a driver of conflict, especially in recent years where many conflicts are within states and uh, where parties to the conflict are divided by ethnic group, religion,
religious affiliation uh, language and so we have seen how it is important to uh, apply a cultural lens to the situations from the start it's not a secondary thought it is critical right there and there and which means uh, the second main uh, lesson learned it's about the people you have to uh, sort of uh, work very closely with the people it's about uh, expectation it's about uh, aspiration for the future um, again something that mr mancervisi said culture is not static it's uh, evo evolving especially after uh, um, a, a conflict for example where the cities have destroyed or after a natural disaster with influx of new people uh, you know old people leaving people need to adapt to sort of uh, you know uh, reassess who they are what they want to be sometimes uh, the new cities or the new uh, you know country will be different or slightly different from what it was and so people are key you have to do it with them for them you know and <laughs> according to their feelings and was this one of the successes from the project in Timbuktu when you reconstructed some of the uh, temples and the scrolls Indeed. and you really got the community involved. Indeed. It would not have been possible to do it without the community. You know, there were 14 mausoleums, uh, each uh, devoted to one saint, each uh, sort of venerated by one specific community within the city. So first of all, they made it clear from the start, all the projects had to start at the same time couldn't start with uh, you know one first because no one wanted to be left behind secondly it had to be done with the masons from the specific groups that had uh, preserved and maintained those mausoleums for generations you couldn't bring in someone else to do it it was a long negotiation within the architects and the local masons then there was a religious dimension for example when the temples were uh, reconstructed they had to be reconsecrated so that the community could reappropriate them and uh, there was a, sp a special ceremony that took place which was rather moving uh, that uh, had only taken place once 700 years earlier uh, which really marked the mm, sort of the rebirth of uh, you know the cultural identity of the community of the city it was a, uh, an extraordinary moment so very important to get the community involved Toshi Yuko, if I can come to you, I know that you were only elected uh, president uh, at the end of last year, but you've been very active with UNESCO and also with e-commerce before. What would you say are the lessons learned of the, the past in terms of reconstruction and recovery? Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor. Um, uh, well, e-commerce has been working uh, very hard during the last two or three years, especially for the reconstruction and in post-trauma context. And uh, uh, recently, very recently, e-commerce set up a special website for the reconstruction. So the outcomes of recent events are, are available on the website. And uh, through uh, one of the first uh, outcome, uh, first outcomes of the, um, the our activity is to draft a guidance document for the reconstruction war ready site in the post-trauma context. And in that um, event, uh, there was a strong voice or a strong let's say, request uh, for a case studies, case studies, because the reconstruction is very contextual, and in each case it's, it's different. Um, and the, m the the more detailed the the case study is, however, the the more difficult access is to compare or the knowledge transfer to become more difficult. So, uh, for example, in the case of Mali, it was uh, inscribed at War Heritage in 1988, and then it was destroyed uh, much later, uh, the, but the mausoleums and the mosques were the target. While in, in, a, in the case of Bamiyan and, uh, and Mostar, they, they were first destroyed and then reconstructed. In the case was the, um, so the, the Bamiyan was a la rather, la and then inscribed at War Heritage as a cultural landscape, while the in Bosnia and Herzegovina was the old town. <coughs> So it is, uh, the this shows the differences. But then we need, we need to realize that we have to create a platform on which the comparison could be made. But the knowledge transfer from a previous example would be possible. This is the, 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 uh, the, the need, and then we 
just completed that ask, uh, the task and it is available on the website. So I hope that e-commerce could further contribute to knowing better from the past uh, experiences. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so obviously no size fits all, every individual context, but this need for uh, documentation and uh, use of to technology. Marcus, if I can bring you into the conversation with your hat on as a, uh, from a museum perspective, what, what have you learned uh, from the reconstruction and recovery efforts that have been going on in places like uh, Mali, Afghanistan, uh, Bosnia? Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very pleased and honored to be here as well. I think what we've learned over the last years, uh, looking at Iraq, looking at Syria and other places, is that documentation is key. And I think this cannot be overstressed uh, whenever you need to recover objects, when you want to reconstruct them. Even when you start conservation work, you need to know what they were like before. So this is extremely important, um, which is why we usually say you need three things in preventive uh, cultural heritage protection. It's documentation, documentation, documentation. <laughs> It sounds funny, but it's not because inventorying for museums is extremely important. It's the basis for everything else. It's also the basis for fighting illicit trafficking because only if you know that an object has belonged to a certain collection, it will be able to start um, effective law enforcement measures in many cases. So on many levels, um, what we've learned is that if we do our job right, if we do our homework as heritage professionals, as museum directors and curators, um, we can contribute immensely to the protection of cultural heritage by doing preventive measures. And this, of course, is also true for immovable heritage. This is true for um, disaster risk management on a local and regional level. This is true for involving local communities. So I think what we've learned from disasters all around the world is that we should be better prepared to face these disasters when they occur. And that obviously is also true for Europe and not just for countries and regions outside of Europe. Yes, thank you very much for those remarks about the importance of preparation. Uh, Walter, um, not a, as you were saying to me earlier, not a technical expert, but somebody who is involved in drafting uh, policies. And so how has the past and some of the reflections of the experts uh, helped you draft policies for the, for the future? Thank you, and good morning to all. Well, as somebody who exploits the work of the experts, I would say that um, well, there are quite a few things that are important. I mean, uh, the fact that culture is inherent to any post-trauma intervention, because trauma is always about identity, and culture is part of the identity. So we need to look at that context as well. We need to change the context in many cases, because of course culture can also be at the origin and the source of the conflicts. Cultural divides we are as dangerous as economic uh, inequality, as we know. But the key word is really sustainability, how you can ensure the sustainability. And there's no other way, I think, apart from uh, trying to involve the community a broader, to make the community larger, really, to make as many people as possible care about heritage, not to see just as the heritage of their clan, of their tribe, of their nation, but to take uh, really a broader perspective about history, about who they are. If I can uh, summarize it, I mean, the fact that culture is dynamic, I mean, it might sound paradoxical, paradoxical because we are talking about how to preserve, how to protect, no, cultural heritage. But the fact that culture evolves and that it is dynamic is a good thing because that gives us hope to overcome the divides. And that the work, that's the work really that we have been doing in Bosnia and Kosovo. That's what we have learned. It takes time, but it's the only way really to solve the situation. Yes, indeed. Well, let's now address the current situation. We've had some lessons from the past, the importance of preparation, documentation, uh, in involving the community. So perhaps, uh, Giovanni, I can start uh, with you. Uh, if we look at these uh, countries uh, at different stages, uh, some are still at war, uh, some are post-conflict, uh, but how can you, how are, is UNESCO working with local partners, applying some of these good practices and lessons learned 
to the situation in those countries. Well, as you said, um, every case is uh, ad hoc. It's you know a different uh, context. It depends on the governance, on political divides, on uh, accessibility, security. So it's difficult to establish a single you know one size fits all and go to Yemen or to Syria and apply. So there is a very important work of uh, uh, negotiation, understanding uh, you know the context. Um, in a place like uh, Iraq, for example, there is a government which has uh, taken the lead for a country-wide uh, recovery and reconstruction initiative. Um, it has set up an institutional framework, uh, you know, a different level from the prime minister's office to local governorates. And uh, it has included, uh, for example, the conservation of cultural heritage as a key component uh, within the relevant pillars of this uh, recovery framework. So in a sense, the door is open. And so it is easy for UNESCO to uh, play its role, which is to bring together the international community, assist, uh, support, facilitate. And this is why uh, the Director General of UNESCO um, has recently launched an initiative for the reviving of the spirit of Mosul. We have chosen Mosul, well, first of all, it's the largest city in the uh, northern region of Iraq, um, but it is also emblematic of the larger problems that affected Iraq over the past uh, now over 30 years. A constant uh, uh, conflict, sometimes uh, you know, visible, sometimes uh, underground, related to um, the fact that the diversity of the culture of the country has been never seen as a source of richness and uh, a resource, but rather it was the source of uh, inter-ethnic tensions. And the successive uh, policies of discrimination and exclusion have led to the strong resentment which has uh, then brought to the you know, protracted uh, civil war with some help from outside, of course. And um, and the Mosul being, if you wish, the symbol of a diverse city which for thousands of years has seen different groups living together more or less in peace and harmony had to be the place to start, to uh, rebuild the fabric of the society. By the way, there's also an interesting connection there because Mosul is a place from which a famous fabric you know, was exported and even in Europe, Mosulin, it's the name. So by uh, reviving the spirit of Mosul, the intention is to work with the local community with all its different components, Sunni, Shia, Christian, Yazidi, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Kurds, um, to reshape a new Iraq where uh, the society is open and inclusive and tolerant culture is celebrated, promoted, even at the cost of changing some of the things along the way because a lot has been destroyed. You cannot uh, sort of force people to either go back to exactly what was there before or nothing. Mm. And so w w you're at the planning stage at, at the moment, the, the mapping of the damage, yes. the destruction. <coughs> we have done now uh, an assessment of the old city of Mosul, <coughs> which uh, is about 16,000 buildings. The site is still uh, is secure, it's full of mines. This was done with uh, drones and then uh, photographs. Uh, out of the 16,000, about 8,000 have been uh, destroyed. However, some pockets of the texture of the city are still there and we can start from those to sort of uh, reconnect uh, them. And there are some 150 mosques and churches. Uh, we have started with the most uh, iconic, the one that was destroyed deliberately by the Islamic State only a couple of days before being defeated. And uh, at the same time, we're working on the National Museum of Mosul, the one where Islamic State, uh, you know, shot videos with this militants smashing, you know, uh, statues. And uh, and then another iconic building that we really want to also work uh, on quickly is the uh, s uh, shrine of Nabi Yunis, the prophet Jonas, which is uh, venerated by all ethnic groups in the city. But the city itself is the core of the project. 
people want to go back apparently every week 70,000 people go back to Mosul um, and they want to rebuild and restore and they want to sort of get rid of the debris and, uh, and build and what is critical now is to set up a regulatory framework and uh, um, assist the Iraqi authorities and the local authorities to create the, the, the system whereby these people will receive support and will be uh, helped to rebuild according to certain criteria, not just in any way. Uh, one problem is materials, one problem is, of course, uh, money, one problem is skills. So the project uh, that we have developed include, of course, a lot of uh, capacity building, uh, cash for work. As it was mentioned, uh, this is an opportunity to provide employment uh, uh, for the youth, for the women, depending, you know, and um, and to get the society, you know, starting again around culture. Thank you very much for giving us that insight in what's happening to uh, Mosul and encouraging on reviving that spirit of that really Im uh, important city. Uh, uh, Toshiyuki, um, mention of technology there, of course, which is uh, uh, very Im Im important uh, for your organization. Um, what uh, are you doing uh, at the moment in, in, in the region? I mean, Iraq, as Giovanni said, is fortunately an open door, uh, stability, and it's probably post-conflict. Uh, Yemen and Syria are not there yet. But what is your organization uh, uh, doing? Well, um, I well, maybe I would uh, like to mention a couple of things in this context. One thing is that uh, the reconstruction is a process, so we have to start to look at the, the, the what what was before, and what happens, and what should be in in the future, and uh, th that uh, process thinking is, is is quite important, and uh, in in for this uh, purpose, uh, we should look at not only the good practice but also the bad practice. We should learn from the bad practice, and we should not repeat it anymore. And uh, and in and also the we like to mention that the uh, not only reconstruction the heritage itself but the in a broader context such as an urban rehabilitation so it re it is linked to the uh, the, uh, the property right uh, recovery of property right for example uh, th this uh, aspect must be uh, closely looked at otherwise the it is very difficult to control the uh, the development projects. And um, the through this process, uh, of course, we need local people, local people. And what uh, uh, the ECOMOS uh, did in, in the past was, for example, um, the in, in, in Syria, uh, we had a project called the ANCA project. ANCA is the, the Arabic word for Phoenix. So the, uh, we chose, uh, we selected young people and trained them, and then uh, for them to uh, able to use a, a 3D a documentation technology so that uh, they could uh, document applying the, the most recent <coughs> technology. And I hope that, that that can be further developed in other countries, such as Iraq and then even and then Libya, and uh, we are more than happy to share that the know-how. Excellent. Marcus, yes, documentation and, of course, uh, new technology can, uh, can help with that, whether it's uh, the 3D scanning, whether it's drones. Uh, it perhaps if you can say, say a, f a few, few words about digitization, documentation, how, how can somebody with your expertise uh, contribute to the reconstruction and recovery? I come from cuneiform studies originally, and cuneiform is a script that is three-dimensional. So ever since I've been in this field, I've been looking for methods to adequately document cuneiform tablets and 3D technology for the first time, let alone holography, which we played with in the 1990s, but 3D technology for the first time offers us a good method to record, to document um, cuneiform tablets, for example, because they're three-dimensional objects that offer a three-dimensional script. So I think 3D digitization offers enormous potentials for the documentation of material cultural heritage just because it is it allows you to document 
holistically, three-dimensionally, but it also is metrically very exact. And I think this is the biggest potential that when it's done right, you have very, very good, very accurate data on the object that also would allow you to do conservation work or to do, if you decide to do so, uh, reconstruction work. So there are lots of opportunities that come with using this technology. At the same time, it also has to be said that we're just beginning to understand what these opportunities are. I think it's cultural heritage experts and specialists who need to drive the development of this technology towards our needs, because as you know, in medicine and architecture, 3D technology is very advanced. But when you come to the point of 3D digitizing a coin or a translucent object, things become very tricky. So we need advancement in that technology and that can only be driven by experts. Second point I would like to make, and this is something that has been bothering me and many other people, is that we still do have this large digital divide, the digital gap globally. Um, we've been talking to Iraqi colleagues um, for years. We've also been talking about 3D digitizing archaeological objects. The um, British Museum has a large 3D digitization initiative with Iraq. But what does Iraq do with the data? I think we have to make sure that 3D digitization does not lead to another form of neocolonial asymmetry. We have to make sure that when we have this data and when we can produce the data, the data can be shared and can be used by the countries in which the cultural heritage is situated. So when we talk about documentation, when we talk about cultural policies in the area of cultural heritage protection, we have to make sure that there will be equal access to technologies, storage facilities, security is a big issue, and also the shareability of data. And there is, of course, as you know, um, a very special initiative by the Victoria and Albert Museum called REACH, which has been trying to gather many different um, actors also in this room this morning. Uh, and this initiative is trying to find out how the 3D digitization and the digitization of cultural heritage and art can be made more accessible mm -hmm. on a global level. One of the things, of course, is building capacity. Now, Toshiyuku was talking mm -hmm. about bad practice and also this good practice. Um, it's also about sharing the, the expertise that, that you have. And can you share with us uh, some of the capacity building initiatives uh, that you've organized? Yes, um, capacity building, as a matter of fact, is one of the pillars of cultural heritage protection because, as, as I just said, we need to make sure that capacity is distributed evenly. Um, when there are only experts in one room, like today, cultural heritage not necessarily is built up or conserved, but we need to make sure that there is equal access to the knowledge and the capacities. Uh, as a museum, capacity building is not your first and core task, but at the same time, a museum is an expert institution, so we've been trying to share our knowledge and exchange knowledge with colleagues from Iraq and Syria. And we've done two things, basically. One, with colleagues from Syria that we've invited to come to the museum to study cuneiform tablet conservation, uh, which is a very specific field with very few experts all over the world. And in Syria some years ago, as, as some of you may know, um, collections, regional collections were evacuated in order to protect them. And then you had the issue of many, many thousands of cuneiform tablets in a single museum that need to undergo conservational treatment. So we try to um, bring those people to Berlin and work with them and explain to them how we're doing this. Um, the other thing that we've been doing together with the permanent delegation of Iraq to UNESCO was a capacity building dialogue that was trying to find out how to make capacity building sustainable. Because of course, we, we do have a model of interpersonal capacity building, that, but that's not always sustainable because the knowledge is not necessarily shared back home. So you have to make sure that there is a policy framework that ensures that the knowledge that has been transferred is made sustainable and can actually have impact on the ground. And it has to be the right knowledge that's shared, the right techniques, the, uh, the exactly. as you say, these are very complex uh, sites to reconstruct. Uh, Walter, w w hearing, hearing all of this, um, how does this help you uh, design uh, uh, policies for reconstruction and recovery? <coughs> well, of course, capacity building is absolutely essential. And I think uh, uh, Silvio mentioned
Rachel, but also uh, Stefano, what we're doing in that field, in particular through the, um, the technical assistance that we're providing to countries like Iraq, which was mentioned. Um, there, I mean, there are two aspects, really. One is the cooperation between governments, because we are helping the Iraqi authorities set up their own structure, set up uh, their own police law enforcement capacities to, to prevent illicit trafficking, to protect their own heritage. Uh, there, there is a, an expert in uh, fighting organized crime that has been uh, dispatched to Baghdad to help them uh, in this, uh, in this uh, field. But probably what is even more important is the kind of cooperation between cultural stakeholders, between museums that is taken up. And this is really actually at the heart of when we proposed two years ago our joint communication, our strategy for international cultural relations. It was less about the kind of dialogue that you can have between governments and a lot about what stakeholders can do. In that respect, museums are absolutely essential for sharing knowledge and for making sure that that knowledge really trickles down to the right level. Something that for governments, in a dialogue between governments, is almost impossible. The only way to provide sustainability is to build these networks that share knowledge and to ensure that they survive. And that should be the primary role, I think, of policymaking in this aspect. You, you've been mentioning Iraq, the open door, which is uh, very good news. Um, perhaps Syria, not so easy, of course, because the, the conflict is uh, uh, still going on. Uh, Giovanni, can I ask you what you know? What are the challenges? How do you approach uh, this? <coughs> well, in Syria, with support from the European Commission and other countries, we've been working now for several years to support the Antiquities Directorate to preserve uh, the cultural heritage of the country, and uh, uh, we have had an extraordinary number of uh, achievements. Uh, for example dozens of capacity building uh, uh, workshops, including with the German Archaeological Institute. Uh, we trained people in uh, uh, evacuation, uh, storage, packaging. We provided them uh, tons of uh, equipment and materials uh, for museum uh, collections. Uh, we also uh, did a lot of documentation, more than uh, 190 sites were carefully assessed. Uh, in Aleppo, we have conducted uh, a very thorough report on the state of conservation together with our uh, partner UNOSAT, uh, UN body dealing with satellite imagery, a report which uh, should be published shortly. Um, and also we have, we have done some actual technical assistance, for example interventions in the citadel of Aleppo and other restoration interventions. Uh, but it is true that uh, because of the political context uh, uh, and the policy taken at the UN level in New York, I mean, uh, the whole we are not there uh, yet completely integrated into the reconstruction and recovery effort, which is happening, by the way, uh, led by the government and many other players. For example, um, it is the Chechen government which is now financing the restoration of the Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo, contrary to you know the case of uh, Mosul, where UNESCO was able to step in. Um, and so the challenge for us is <coughs> to ensure that this uh, reconstruction and uh, re recovery which has taken place uh, is done according to certain principles. And, uh, and uh, so here we try to work with the different levels of authority to, to provide advice and to uh, maintain a channel. This is a point that I wanted to stress. Throughout all this period, the seven years of war, UNESCO has constantly worked with the Directorate General for Antiquities and Museums. Regardless of any political consideration, we did many meetings. We brought together people from the government, people from the different you know, factions of the oppositions, because we felt that this was absolutely critical at the time when many other countries uh, were not able to do so because of sanctions, etc. This is maybe another <laughs> of the lessons learned is the importance of multilateralism, of leaving one door open through an organization like UNESCO at all times. This is very interesting, of course, because you know, in the world's media, I think in January 2017, when you made a, an assessment mission in Aleppo, there was a lot of headlines about 30% uh, destroyed, 60% damage, but you have been working behind the scenes. And you're, I wonder whether you could just update us on the role of the International Observatory of Syria's Cultural Heritage. This is part of U UNESCO based yeah. in Beirut. Yeah, this is ongoing. Of course, we have some problems with funding, mm. uh, but uh, we are hopeful that in 2019, 
30% destroyed, 60% uh, damaged. Uh, what, what, what hopes are there for the uh, reconstruction and recovery? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, uh, well, there are some uh, very specific features in the case of Aleppo and Mobile. First of all, it is very large. I, it has uh, s approximately 360 hectare. Uh, the Mostar, for example, that was a 7.6 hectare. So it's 50 times bigger than Mostar. And uh, the, the Aleppo is the second largest city in, in Syria. So lots of activities and economic pressure are there, much stronger. And uh, well, <coughs> and the uh, people have to survive. So the, the, the monuments and, and the restoration need for the restoration, the people survival. How to how to let them survive? Th these two things are happening at the same time. And um, the uh, well, so it is. Probably the uh, one of the most difficult cases that the Turkish uh, communities uh, should tackle uh, in as, as soon as possible. And this said that the um, this is the, s the, the, the recovery of, of cities, the la rather relatively large cities. So we have to recognize there are certain levels. Uh, let's say um, urban fabric, new architecture. Uh, and also this the, the people's ceremonies and rituals and these um, intangible aspects. And the, the, and, uh, the, the bottom line is that the, the property right. So the we have to uh, distinguish these uh, phases and the tackle is concentrated on each, each, each phase. And we can already start what we could do for, for, for each, each phase. And the, I myself am very much interested in the, 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 the Revisiting the property issue, uh, the the we were told that, that there was there was a speculation, speculation, and a lot of money has already invested there. <coughs> but uh, is it a really fair, uh, legitimate transaction, legally speaking? And uh, this is we, we we could raise that fundamental question. And the the if the the property sh the, the previous owner or the, those who left Aleppo could be recovered, then it could also contribute to the uh, sound reconstruction. Uh, and I would like to cite an example of the Great Fire in London in 1666. There was a few uh, redevelopment projects, and it was not possible because of the, the property. The property. So uh, this property issue could be a key to very sustainable uh, and uh, acceptable re reconstruction. So we're in a race against time mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Um, if you're wanting to start uh, planning the reconstruction and, 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 and recovery, because as you're saying, the property developers are, are moving in, seeing the op economic opportunities. I think at this uh, the critical, critical uh, observation of the property, property issue should be combined with international assistance. I think without that aspect, uh, just putting money for international assistance would be, could be wasted, in, in my view. It could become a second uh, bad practice. Marcus, Aleppo. So you have the conservationists who are obviously very keen to start work, and it's a very complex uh, site to start to reconstructing. But then, of course, you've got uh, the, uh, the the communities. So how do you how do you balance the the the, the two? It's it's a very complex question, and as a as a museum director and movable heritage specialist, I'm probably not the one to talk about this very complex issue. Um, but I do think that it is extremely important to involve local communities, and that to some degree this has to be a bottom-up process. Mm -hmm. um, it it has always been an international consensus that the cultural heritage belongs to the country and the state in which it is located. This is one of the basic principles also of the 1970 Convention of UNESCO that we will probably talk about um, later. And this also applies for all other areas of cultural heritage protection. So in a case like Aleppo, um, as was just said, we have a very complex situation because the country is still not at peace, as, as we all know. Um, the population is suffering. There is an enormous humanitarian crisis going on. And at the same time, we also know that different stakeholder groups are starting to think about the reconstruction of Aleppo. Um, so
so this could actually be one of a one of the best case practice examples where the international community multilateral organizations offer help mm. to the government and the population of Syria but start a bottom up process that involves local communities local experts and that will end in a city that you want to live in it has to become Aleppo like it was before a multicultural um, very lively city where people want to go and where the history of centuries is still alive in, 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 in the walls of the buildings that has to be the aim and this is an extremely complex task but it is one where the international community and also the experts can grow um, substantially yes, yes, it has get Giovanni no, I just wanted to follow up to say yeah. that <coughs> the, the Syrian government has set up a steering uh, committee to oversee the uh, recovery and reconstruction of Aleppo, which involves different ministries and also the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. We have a representative in the room. And, uh, and UNESCO is supporting this process uh, as best as we can. We are also there, but we're not driving it, of course. And, uh, however, what we have been doing is to do a lot of training, uh, for example, of masons, to create the capacity of uh, you know, labor, mm -hmm. skilled labor to, to tackle the huge amount of... Uh, and then also um, we have done an assessment to understand the needs in terms of material. Traditional materials are difficult to find, so we are now planning to mm, identify the needs and provide for those materials so that it will be possible for the inhabitants of the uh, old city so we're talking about the old city now Aleppo is a four million yeah. people yeah. Yeah. you know huge city yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and so then there are also other kinds of uh, training that we provide on the documentation uh, so this is like software <laughs> and then the hardware hopefully will come and uh, Walter uh, yes uh, involving the, 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 the community very important that it's the uh, Aleppo that the people from Aleppo uh, want. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a section uh, later on on participatory uh, governance, uh, uh, which my co-facilitator Jasper is going to facilitate. But uh, yes, uh, um, tell yeah, us Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, re rebuilding Syria will be a, a huge, huge challenge. And uh, with the hostilities still going on, and the, the po political context is extremely complicated, and uh, we don't know where where we're going, basically. I mean, things might change every day. Th there might be dramatic accidents any day. Um, and of course, the Assad regime is also uh, under sanction. So w what ca can we do now? G getting ready, getting ready, being prepared, as uh, UNESCO is doing, is obviously essential. Um, no, wh one thing that the international community could also be doing is to support uh, the intangible heritage of the Syrians, because that's really what we are trying to preserve, not the values of, uh, of heritage. One way of doing it is to help the huge number of displaced people, making sure that wherever they are, they are not losing contact with their own culture, which is a real risk because they have been refugees for quite several years by now, and I'm, I'm not optimistic about their chances of going back very, very soon. So that's part of the work that we are doing. We are also doing it through education, because of course these people need to to receive education, they also need to receive education about their own culture to develop a cultural awareness of who they are. And another way of supporting the intangible heritage of uh, Syrians is what, for instance, we are doing together with uh, our friends in the Goethe Institute these days in Brussels. I mean, uh, pro giving hospitality and opportunities for Syrian artists, for Syrian work of arts, for Syrian culture to be on display and to continue evolving, as a matter of fact. It's not just putting them on display. No, we give them opportunities to evolve and to build a new culture for Syria. Uh, not much else, I'm afraid, that we can do, but the preparation work, of course, absolutely essential. Marcus, do you want to say a few words? There was a lot of media attention when uh, your museum, with other partners, uh, the Mutakla project, where involving so many Syrian uh, refugees and Iraqi refugees uh, to become tour guides. So that is a way of keeping the, the, the culture going within the I do think that this is an extremely important um, project for many different reasons. It was initiated by the Museum for Islamic Art, which is also based at the Bergamon Museum. And it had to do with the fact that we as expert institutions have been trying to work with people from Iraq and Syria for some time. So there have been people um, 
Khan Museum Island that originally came from Iraq and Syria and who had started to know that there was cultural heritage from their country on Museum Island in Berlin, which for many of them, some, some school children, was quite surprising. Why is the Ishtar Gate of Babylon in Berlin on a Museum Island, which is not, let's say, a very easy to answer <laughs> question. Th th that's most probably another conference. <laughs> um, yes, and but that, <laughs> of course, is the challenge, and that is also the chance, because um, it allows you to talk about acquisition history on the one hand, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, and this is even more important, it brings into the museum a different kind of narrative. And I think this, for the development of museums, especially in the old world, in Europe, is extremely important, because so far it has been the discourse of the curators who's informed audiences about what you can see in the museum. And I think now that we're starting to understand that museums have a social role to play, and this was emphasized, of course, by the UNESCO recommendation on, on museums in, in 2015, now that we've understood this, it becomes more and more important to include different narratives um, in the museum displays. And, and, and this is something that was very, very moving to see children from Iraq and Syria stand in front of their cultural heritage and understand that this comes from their home country. And I think it, this needs to be done also in order to ensure that museums that were created in a time of cultural and political asymmetry are able to talk to and work with um, the countries that the cultural heritage comes from. We have to arrive at a level of communication where we're able to talk to each other eye to eye, and that of course also includes full accountability by the respective institutions in Europe, for example. So when we talk about colonial collections, when we talk about provenance research, this of course also applies to archaeological museums and will be extremely important for preparing the ground for a good cooperation in the sector also of cultural heritage protection. So Multaka really has been one of these model projects that show you how you include different kinds of narratives from um, the countries of origin into um, in, in, in a, a museum display or museum collection. Yes, Giovanna. I, I have to add, because otherwise I'll regret it, that thanks again to the European Commission, and in particular to something called the Instrument for Stability and Peace, we are able now to work in Iraq, in Syria, Yemen, and uh, <coughs> Libya, specifically on the displays on the intangible cultural heritage. So the, we sort of shift the perspective rather than looking at the you know, physical fabric, we look at the people and what it is important to them. Mm. And uh, this is an extraordinary you know, innovation, including at UNESCO, because uh, all our conventions are place-based in a sense. No? We never really followed the people. Mm. And, uh, and uh, this is um, put cultural rights at the you know, center. So what does it mean for people who have gone through such a you know, uh, terrible time to mm, uh, redefine their culture, to participate, yeah. to choose, to decide who they want to be? And these uh, are exactly the kind of issues that initiatives like uh, the one that Marcus was talking about uh, deal with. Before we move on to regulation, I just wanted to have a word on international coordination. Uh, you know, between the UN uh, actors, you mentioned the Aga Khan Foundation. I think I'd read somewhere that uh, there was an offer for them to uh, renovate the ancient uh, part of Aleppo or 20% of it. So you've got so many different actors at the UN scale, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, the Red Crescent, the humanitarians. How d are you going to get all of these people to, to work uh, together? And uh, you know, for humanitarians, uh, the peace builders, how do you get them to make culture a priority or at least get it on their agenda? Well, this is one of the most difficult things. UNESCO in 2015 adopted a new uh, strategy to respond to this kind of issues uh, endorsed by all the member states of UNESCO, um, which had two objectives. The first was to uh, support member states in protecting, preparing, to emergency. But the second, which is ma maybe the most innovative objective, was precisely to uh, integrate a cultural 
perspective into the work of humanitarians, um, security, peacekeepers, peace builders. And uh, from that strategy in 2015 uh, followed uh, an action plan with a number of interesting initiatives that we are now pursuing, which uh, led us to uh, work with uh, the UN Department of Peacekeeping, with NATO, with uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, with the UNDP, UNISDR, which are UN bodies that you know work on disaster risk preparedness, and uh, the, the, the idea at the sort of the, you know, the bottom line is to um, have culture becoming a major concern in all of these uh, you know uh, programs and strategies. Mm. And so it's not just an afterthought; it's built into <coughs> the reconstruction <coughs> by the exactly. uh, the, the, so the so UN uh, communities. Uh, policy levels there have been already some major breakthrough for example in disaster risk reduction which is the way it is called you know yeah, I come from Geneva I know the acronyms but I don't so know whether this audience does but yes indeed yeah. so as far as natural disasters are concerned uh, there was a major document adopted in 2015 called the Sendai framework for disaster risk uh, reduction I'm sure mm, that the Japanese <laughs> so are involved knows about in that it yes. because it was done in Japan and culture suddenly sprung everywhere across this long document at every section, you know, understanding risk, the governance, uh, the preparedness, the response, uh, magically, you know. And uh, other incredible developments were, for example, in the UN Security Council that started to think that cultural heritage and culture were important things. In uh, March of last year, um, almost a year from now, the 2347 resolution was adopted by the Security Council, the first ever resolution exclusively on the protection of cultural property, which the Security Council identified as a security issue, not a cultural concern of uh, museum directors or architects <laughs> like that, but uh, a question that uh, must be put at the core of strategies to maintain the peace. So it's gradually being mainstreamed, yes. to use the jargon. I, in September, the Human Rights Council in Geneva adopted another breakthrough resolution, number 33, which basically says again that uh, you have to protect cultural rights of people if you want to protect <coughs> human rights and peace and stability. So now we are working with the Human Rights Council, with the Office of the High Commissioner, to develop uh, guidelines for uh, applying a culture-based approach to humanitarian peacekeeping, peacebuilding strategies. So, so there's a really good cross-fertilization of exactly. the cultural experts and the humanitarians and the yes. conflict. It's a, a huge and new area of work for UNESCO, in a sense very exciting and interesting, but also uh, daunting, if I may, because it's, you know, working with the hundreds of new institutions that are there, actually much bigger and uh, more structured than us, and uh, so we are just uh, the, the newcomers. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's like when sustainable de development became part of the process and now it's culture, it indeed. Yes. Let's move on to uh, regulation before we take questions uh, from the uh, or audience. Marcus, if I can bring you in, because you've been leading this illicit project with the German criminal uh, police. Because, of course, uh, trying to regulate, trying to stop illicit trafficking of uh, cultural goods, but we have to sort of know what are we looking at? What do we know about illicit trafficking of cultural goods? Yes, we started in 2015 um, because the main issue was and still is that we lack accurate data. If you follow the discussion on illicit trafficking, if you follow the statements of the art market, you follow the statements of um, governments or um, customs, you will realize that nobody is operating with solid data. And this is one of the biggest problems for both sides because it's difficult to make substantial claims in this area. So we were approached, um, I, was, I was then teaching at Heidelberg University as a professor for archaeology, uh, and we were approached by National Criminal Police to come up with a project that would investigate methods that could be used to arrive at solid data. So we're at a very basic point of departure where we're not even sure what methods and instruments to use to understand what's actually going on. In criminology, you talk about eight 
dark field, you know something's going on, but you know virtually nothing else about what's going on. So we've started um, with a transdisciplinary consortium that includes ancient studies, experts, sociologists, but also IT specialists uh, to try to find out if the traditional methods of criminology, the traditional methods of dark field research also work in the field of illicit trafficking with cultural goods. And what we're finding, what we're seeing now is that some of them do work and others don't. Um, we will publish our report, our findings um, at the end of 2018. What we're seeing is um, that in Germany, we're focusing only in Germany, there is still a rather high number of archaeological objects from the Eastern Mediterranean um, offered for sale openly in the market. And what worries us is that the provenance information that is given on the internet, for example, with these objects is extremely sparse. And this, of course, is also an issue of consumer protection. How do you know, given the existing regulations, um, also the European regulations concerning Iraq and Syria, how can you be sure that what you're buying on the internet is actually imported into the European Union legally? So I think what we're seeing here is that there is an issue still. I'm not saying that all of these objects or even one single object here is illegal, but there is a problem because we see an influx of protected cultural heritage heritage that has been protected by the country of origin and at the same time we're not able to understand how this heritage entered the single market or the German market. So we need more um, or we, we need a better understanding of what is actually going on but we also need to make sure that the information that is provided along with a, an object allows the average customer or collector to assess the legal status of this object. At the same time, let me say one more thing. We must not forget that the challenge of illicit trafficking in cultural property um, did not start with Daesh. Um, when you've been in ancient studies for most of your life, you know that, for example, in countries like Iraq and Syria, archaeological sites have been looted since the dawn of archaeology. When you look at Iraq, for example, you, you know that looting surged again in the early 1990s and then again after 2003, and this had nothing to do with terrorism. This had to do with criminal groups, organized crime in the country itself. It had to do with a pronounced political instability and an economic crisis. And of course, it has to do with the fact that there is a demand. So I think we need to look at the problem of illicit trafficking more holistically in the sense that regulations are extremely important and we need effective regulations. They need to be practical and they also need to be implemented on a national level. But at the same time, you need awareness raising and you have to make sure that the incentives for looting and plundering are not there anymore, anymore in the countries where it's taking place. And you have to make sure that there is an awareness raising with the market and also with the collectors that it's good to collect only objects that were imported legally and not objects that were excavated using violence. So there are UN security resolutions banning the input of cultural artifacts from Syria and Iraq. But from what you're seeing, these objects are appearing on online uh, platforms despite the good intentions of the, of, of the resolution? Well, what we're seeing is that there are objects in the market that seem to come from Iraq and Syria. The problem is we cannot distinguish by the information that's accompanying these objects, whether these objects have been around for the last 100 years, which is entirely possible, or whether they were exported from Syria three weeks ago. And when you combine that with the observation that we still, as we speak, have plunderings, lootings ongoing in Iraq and Syria. When you look at the numbers that the Turkish police and the Lebanese authorities give us about objects that have been confiscated in Turkey and Lebanon, and 
think when you look at the fact that there are still objects in the market, and I'm only talking about Germany, I have no idea about the European market because there is no consistent monitoring 24-7, uh, um, and, and maybe we should talk about that as well. If, if I combine all this circumstantial evidence, I do think we have a problem. And it may just be a problem of transparency and accountability, but it may also be a more serious problem. And I think that's why it's so important to look at it holistically and not to focus it exclusively on the charge or the claim that it's financing terrorism. Um, Walter, of course, uh, as uh, Marcus was saying, this is an initiative which is looking at Germany. Uh, national states have all got uh, different rules on uh, the import of these, co these cultural goods. Uh, can you bring us up to date on this Commission's proposal, uh, which I understand is now being discussed by parliamentarians and member states, on um, regulating the import into the EU of cultural goods? Yes. Um, j just to, to react uh, uh, very quickly. Yes, of course, I mean, we made our proposal uh, because there was a heightened sense of urgency given what Daesh, ISIS was doing in Syria mm -hmm. and Iraq. But the problem, of course, is bigger, larger, and more ancient than, uh, <laughs> than Daesh uh, um, itself. It's true that we do not have reliable data, almost by definition. This is a criminal, illegal activity, uh, which is further complicated by the fact that not every aspect of this market is illicit, of course. There's a huge <laughs> part of the market which is <laughs> perfectly legitimate. Um, there is a strong suspicion, though, that uh, the size of the illegal market should be proportionate to the size of the legal market. So what are the biggest markets for antiquities in general? Well, the US, Europe, and Japan. So we felt that there was a need to take action in that respect. Uh, the first action is at the border, and uh, I will explain a little bit better the regulation. But there are also other aspects, as was mentioned before. One is building the capacity, of course, of the countries at the origin of the conflict, and we have already explained more or less what we are planning to do for that. Another one is to look within the EU, because it's true, if there were no demand, there probably would be a very, very small supply. We have been working with UNESCO, actually, in order to develop the uh, awareness of the art market in, uh, in, in this field. Uh, the good news, if I can say so, is that uh, there seems to be uh, greater awareness, also because of the public, uh, of exactly of the TV images of Syria and Iraq, on the part of the buyers themselves. We are told that uh, um, y you know the real change will happen when you go, you an object is proposed to you, and when you inquire about the provenance, about the ownership history, and the answer is, well, it comes from a private collector in Switzerland who doesn't know, who doesn't want to be named, then you, you back down, <laughs> and then you don't want to do it. Uh, it seems to be the case that the value of an archaeological object, at least, is increasing if you can prove the ownership history, and that's a good development in the market. Of course, provenance research remains key for all these aspects, because it's extremely difficult, of course, <laughs> to establish the ownership uh, history of an object in general. It's even more difficult if uh, this object seems to pop up, or it is difficult, really difficult, actually, to establish where it comes from, which is not always obvious for, uh, you know, for Roman, uh, Roman items. Huh? They can be from Tunisia, or they can be from Iraq. It's not always obvious no, to know where it comes from. So uh, colleagues are working within the Customs uh, Union, uh, there's an expert group looking into provenance research. We will also continue work with the colleagues working in research about provenance research. We will establish a social platform. So this is a, a long-term uh, chantier for us. But let me get at uh, what happens at the borders, because after all, that's where it should be possible to stop these objects from coming into the EU. We propose this regulation about import exactly because uh, uh, given different regulations and given also different capacities, really, of the law enforcement and of uh, uh, custom offices in, uh, at the borders of the Union in the different countries, there was the serious risk that objects may get into the single market and then they get sort of washed and uh, they're blown with. Um, th the regulation is important because it establishes a first uh, uh, principle while completing the uh, the legal framework, if you want, because we had regulation on exports in order to make sure that uh, you know national treasures are not exported out of the union. You simply need an authorization. It's not that you cannot do it. I mean, but you need to be authorized. Everything has to be legitimate. Uh, then, of course.
Belarus, we have a regulation on the return of cultural objects that were illicitly trafficked within the EU, though, and of course it's not retroactive. And then, now, we have this regulation about imports. Um, let me just say that I, I, I'm a bureaucrat, so I will start by saying that uh, the Union has full competence about the borders, about customs, which is not the case for culture, obviously, and it's not even the case for foreign policy. But when it comes to customs, we can. So the idea is to impose uniform control on the basis of one definition that is shared by the member states and one principle. Basically, it is the source country that decides if the item has been legitimately or not sent out of the country. In order to establish this, uh, you have for certain objects, uh, the one that could be more most easily trafficked, you have to obtain an import license from the EU country where you plan to come in through. To prove this, you can the best way would be to show an export uh, certificate from the uh, origin country, or if the item is not particularly at risk, you can also simply produce a, a, a self-declaration accompanied by an object ID so that it becomes traceable, that it can be possible to know uh, what is going on. Then there is a threshold. There is a threshold because we thought that not all objects are at the same risk of being trafficked illegit illeg uh, illicitly. And also uh, contemporary art objects uh, we think uh, belong to a different market. There are different risks. Of course, there are fakes, uh, there are thieves, and so on. But it's a different situation. So we propose to the member states a threshold of 250 years. So only objects older than 250 years will be object to this special surveillance. Of course, the date, this threshold is partially arbitrary. It comes from the American legislation. We are open to discussion. It's just a discussion what we propose to the experts from the member states. Should it be 200, 300? I mean, <laughs> we don't have a strong view there. But we do think that there should be a threshold because the objective is to produce something that can be worked upon by the custom officers. So we cannot impose too many, too many duties and obligations on them because otherwise, you know, it's not applicable, simply. And also for the art market because the art market, after all, is a more than a legitimate activity. It's also, uh, I think, the biggest, expo Europe is the biggest exporter <laughs> in terms of uh, art, thanks to contemporary art, primarily, but I mean, that's a market also that we need to protect. One key point of the legislation, which is uh, under discussion, of course, and uh, again, this is something on which it is legitimate to have a different opinion, is that in order to simplify the uh, procedures, we are proposing that if the country from which the object is being imported into the EU is not the country where it was discovered or created. If that country, which we call the export country, is a signatory of the UNESCO 1970 Convention, then we assume that it should be there legitimately, because that country should have carried out the checks. Now, this is a, a big point of discussion with the member states. Some member states do not feel reassured. And again, this is a proposal that we put on the table. And uh, uh, we are not the experts, and we will listen to their concerns. Uh, but it was a, a way of making sure that we are not imposing too big a burden on custom officials. Of course, because this is, for many people, a whole new area yes. of research. Just before we go to uh, the audience, I was seeing that Toshiyuku, perhaps with his uh, legal hat on, was busy <coughs> writing notes and your, your, your thoughts on uh, the, these initiatives to stop illicit traffic. Well, I uh, just want to um, congratulate on the very successful, uh, well, let's um, encouraging uh, um, movements in, in EU. In EU. Uh, the, they published a very, very um, um, big report last year, and it just really covers many, many issues. And uh, compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, it was the picture was totally different. There's many, many things are happening uh, since, since 10 years. So um, this is very, very encouraging to me. And the, 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 the difficulty of this issue is that this issue is related to the fundamental question, who owns how? This is really the core of the property law. And this is deeply rooted in, in each legal system. So it's to unify um, very effective rule um, worldwide would be impossible, practically speaking. So in this sense, it is absolutely correct and I fully agree with, with, with Marx that we need a holistic approaches. Deals with international level, operational level, and then traders and the consumers. We, we need we need to do on, on every single level. 
and uh, this is the, the, the movement in EU would be a very good practice for non-EU countries, my, my, my country for example. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, for the development. Thank you very much for broadening that, uh, that out. Um, if I may go to the audience, I'll come back to the panelists for their last uh, moment because I can see that Giovanni is uh, w w wanting to say something and I understand totally uh, from UNESCO's point. But pr can I ask, yes, and uh, of course, if you get your hand up really quickly, uh, then you get uh, the attention. So uh, if I could take a question, first of all, from uh, this uh, gentleman, and then there's the lady in red, and there will be somebody with a microphone who is rushing towards you at the moment. So if we could, if you could say your name, your organization, if you're representing one, and who you would like to ask the question, and then I'll go to the lady in red. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zaki Aslan. I'm the director of the ECOM office uh, in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. I have to say how pleased I am to be at this panel because we work, um, you know, from the region at ECOM. Uh, serving uh, this region and uh, uh, you know as most of you know ICROM was also created by UNESCO many years ago after the Second World War where you know the purpose was really to develop principles um, as an IGO intergovernmental organ organization to provide such such guidance uh, practically what we try to do is provide this guidance from the ground is the, the answering the how for the ground from the ground so our office in fact in the UAE, supported by the UAE, serve the, these purposes. Um, I just wanted to, to, to just highlight uh, the fact how we could continue the coordination and collaboration among the different organizations. And I just want to like, I would just want to mention what we have been doing in the past few years in the area of capacity building. We had actually- If I can ask you, yes, of course, to make your remarks quite of course, close. Of course. And if you have a question- yeah. I just directed. wanted to just highlight, you know, our work in capacity building, the reconstruction meetings that we had in the past years uh, with participation by UNESCO and ECOMOS, the meetings on documentation, but also projects sustaining the capacity building with leaders working in the field in the countries of conflict that are ongoing, and lately working on the legal frameworks where we'll be having a meeting in Algeria to bring the uh, South countries together to look into the issues of illicit traffic. My practical question is the question you asked, uh, Ms. Jewell, uh, which is in the spirit of the title of this uh, session, International Perspective. How, I mean, I was asked this question, I was once in a panel, I was asked the same question. How we can make such international uh, coordination more and more effective? Okay. Who would like to take that one? Giovanni, uh, I, I see you looking at me and uh, from UNESCO. How do we make coordination more effective? Well, uh, we do not have a lack of uh, institutional frameworks. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of, uh, you know, processes, committees, uh, you know, bodies that meet uh, on a regular basis. Sometimes even too much, according to some. And uh, I think uh, that's where the sort of uh, they need to be streamlined. Big policy These, uh, decisions have to be taken. And uh, which has happened actually in a number of occasions. And uh, for example, ICROM, uh, together with ICOMOS and uh, IUCN, which is their equivalent for natural heritage, is mm -hmm. an advisory body to the World Heritage Committee, the next session of which will take place in uh, two months in Bahrain. And in that context, uh, we will bring together all this incredible wealth of expertise to identify uh, priorities for all the sites, including Aleppo. And so this is like the UN cluster system yeah, after a exactly. humanitarian so crisis that, uh, or emergency, yeah. bringing people together with a UN lead. Seen from my point of view as a UN uh, officer, I mean, the problem is that perhaps we have too much enthusiasm, too many initiatives, uh, many very successful, and it's become more difficult to control. You know, every country of the planet wants to do something. Every university has a department. Uh, every NGO has, you know, which is good. And uh, the challenge is to sort of bring this together. But yes, a very good question. Uh, just small, just small mark. Um, well, the I think uh, we need more funding. <laughs> <laughs> very realistic. No, 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 
no surprise. I, I feel very strongly because we are the NGO. We're the NGO. We're the poorest among <laughs> among <laughs> ourselves. But uh, more more funding for longer term, especially for capacity building. We need we need a uh, we need money for longer longer period. And uh, yeah. Money <laughs> and coordination. Any other comments? Uh, I to agree. The <laughs> question <laughs> on effective coordination. Yes, you're almost a victim of your success. There are so many people now who are who are wanting to be involved in, in this. Yeah. I, I, I don't agree. I don't think we need more control and I don't think we need more funding at this point. I think there is plenty of funding. The question is how do you spend it wisely and sustainably? I think one big step towards more coordination could be strengthening UNESCO, could be strengthening the system of multilateralism and when we look at the fact that there are important countries in the world that do not subscribe to the principles of the United Nations anymore, I'm extremely worried. I think this is extremely important on the one hand. On the other hand, I also believe that we need more civil society engagement and that we probably also need more public-private partnerships who actually run the show. I'm not even sure if UNESCO is always the right institution to run every single project on the ground. I don't think it was established for that reason. So we need strong partners for UNESCO that are able to also implement different kinds of um, project designs. And if you have an effective project design, you sometimes need very, very little money to do a lot of good. So I think before we ask for more money, let's see what we can do with the money we have if we use it effectively and then maybe ask for more if it turns out that we need more. Oh yeah, they all <laughs> want to answer this. So Giovanni and then to, to no, I just want to also agree with Marcus on this. We, uh, for example, I am in charge of a unit at UNESCO which is supposed to coordinate this kind of processes. Unit which has zero uh, funding. There is no money in the regular program of UNESCO because it's rather boring to pay staff in UNESCO organizing coordination meeting in Mosul or sending an expert to, to see what's happening in Yemen. It's much better to restore the minaret of Aleppo. And yet, uh, that's precisely maybe the moment when UNESCO doesn't need to be there. However, before you do this, uh, there is a lot of uh, negotiation, mediation that must take place. Uh, and, uh, and that's precisely the part of the process which is critical, but which struggles to find uh, you know, the political and financial support. Yes, the, the, the cultural di uh, di diplomacy. Toshiko, yes, please re yeah, just reply to Marcus, <laughs> who says we, we don't just need I more just share just a piece <laughs> of information, a piece of episode. Uh, ICOMAS organizes the, the big scientific symposium in every four years, and it was in India uh, last December. And uh, we had a one young participant uh, from Syria. And uh, the he was funded, well, we collected some money, and he was funded with some money from, from us. Then a US philanthropy organization looked at the, the program, and they realized that the one Syrian participation. And then the, the money was not spent for him, but they were in a, in a, they were in a position to withdraw their money back. So uh, it was 80,000 US dollars. It was not a small amount for us. And you know, this is, <laughs> this is what I <laughs> we experienced. You know, so yes. money must be there somewhere, but it is not necessarily in the right, 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 right place. Yes, and this US philanthropic organization was they not were, they going They were forced in that position. Yeah, they were forced so they by were the forced in position. So yes. It's a political uh, reality. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much for your question, and I'm sure that uh, these uh, gentlemen will want to give you more in-depth answers uh, o over coffee. But let me now go to the lady in uh, red. Who are you from, and uh, what is your question, and who would you like to answer it? Yeah, um, uh, good morning. I'm Delphine Dupeux. I'm representing the European Historic Alvis Association. Um, I would say m I would like to thank you, first of all, for the debate. Really interesting. And I was listening very carefully about what you're saying about illicit trafficking. Uh, as historic houses uh, owners, we are really concerned about that. It's been 10 years we're working on it. Of course, it's a bit at the margin and it doesn't concern the really the international, but mostly the intra-EU. And But I would like to raise that, you know, we are losing every day cultural objects intra-Europe. And we have difficulty with our private owners because as you can, and you raise
place rightly, Mr. Egard, that there is a problem of inventories, documentation, and private owners are not always very uh, trained or they don't know exactly what's going on. And it's also maybe about, um, yeah, putting back the, the subject in intra-EU. How can we claim to protect the objects that are coming from abroad if we don't do properly intra-EU? And there is a lack of cooperation intra-EU. I know you wanted to tackle this issue, and this is directly linked to the regulation that you're going to put in place. Uh, of course, the hard markets is really important. I think they need to play a role. Uh, I think civil society needs to be a bit more included, and I think private owners also need to be included. We did a survey uh, some years ago, and we noticed that almost 50% of our owners have been stolen, and they never took back their, their uh, goods. So this is a problem, and my question was on the... And it's a question to yes, Walter, I would maybe imagine. Maybe Mr. Elgard and, and Mr. Zampieri, maybe on the regulation, how uh, the EU would uh, maybe invest more on maybe program that could, you know, foster cooperation and try you mostly for the po police forces. Because what we notice and try you is that the police forces are not talking to each other and they are not trained. And I think the, 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 the stealing of cultural goods is, is one specific uh, matters. And for example, only in Belgium, there is only one person in the police that is really dedicated. You imagine in this country, only one person knows how it is about stealing <coughs> uh, cultural objects. So I would like to know a bit more from, from you, from your perspective, what, what can we do more? Okay, to try. And thank you. Walter, would you like to pick up and then uh, Marcus, within the e yeah, EU, um, what can be done? Yes, of course. I mean, I mentioned the different uh, capacities of the police forces as concerns uh, fighting imports, but the same reasoning applies really to the police forces within the EU. Um, huge differential, really. I mean, uh, some police forces, I mentioned the, the Italians are very, very good tradition. They have uh, also a huge database which is accessible because documentation, I mean, clearly, if you cannot prove that you <laughs> what was stolen, <laughs> you cannot really claim it, uh, claim it back at any time. Yes, we, we are working on this, and again, uh, cooperation between police forces is effective. The um, heightened sense of urgency of fighting terrorism is also paying off, because you know, fighting the illicit traffic of cultural goods has become a priority also for the general fight against organized crime. Um, <coughs> we, we are getting there, but I would say we are, we are putting political pressure. The owners should really take care of the documentation, because uh, otherwise we, we cannot go anywhere. Marcus, within Germany. Yes, thank you very much for your question. I think you're raising an extremely important point, and I would like to come back to what you said at the end when you talked about the capacities, for example, in Belgium, um, which, which I know about, and I can tell you that in Germany it doesn't look much better. Um, we have to understand that we're talking about an area of the market that is now stronger, more strongly regulated than it was before. Mm -hmm. And whenever you get stronger regulation, it also means you need to have exist additional capacities and additional expertise. When we look at protected species, for example, we could see that some decades ago, new institutions sprang up, were established on a national and an international level to guarantee that the regulations would be implemented properly. And I think this is what needs to happen both on an international and a national level. Um, we need additional capacities with customs and law enforcement, obviously, because they, they will not be able to deal with the amount of, of new cases, the number of new cases that will exist because of new regulations. And at the same time, we have to make sure that they have access to the scientific, the academic expertise they need to assess what the documents are. And th this obviously is something that we haven't talked about today that maybe we can come back in the, in the closing statements. I think it's extremely important to come up with models that would allow um, law enforcement and customs to tap into the academic expertise of universities and, and other academic institutions. Because before you can confiscate or hold an object, you need to know what it is. You need to know if it's authentic or not. So you need people who can read cuneiform, who know what hieroglyphs are, and who are specialists in, in art history, for example. And where do you have them? You have them at the university. So we need to bring those two sectors together, obviously. And Giovanni? I, uh, I think uh, yeah, it's not um, even a, a technical issue. It's not that we don't know what to do. We, we just have to implement the principle 
principles that are in the conventions that were signed by most countries, including in, you know, in Europe, documenting, creating the capacities, uh, technical services within the authorities, and uh, giving them the, the means and the, you know, the, the training. The UNESCO and UNICEF yes, World Conventions it's need it's to be It's not an expert uh, issue anymore. It's a political will issue. And in terms of, uh, for example, the standard, uh, Marcus, you perhaps remember the object ID, 10, you know, uh, information that was developed by UNESCO and the Getty Conservation Institute uh, many years ago. It is um, a very simple uh, set of uh, data concerning an object that enabled the immediate identification. Now even available with the uh, applications on your smartphone. <coughs> so it's just a matter of doing it. Let me take another question, uh, and then we'll. Uh, and there's a gentleman right at uh, the back who has raised his arm. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Damien Eli. I'm doing consultancy and research and advice in cultural affairs. I was one of the experts uh, working on the EU preparatory action on culture in external relations, and I'm very glad to see that we're reaching that level of discussion two years after the work we've done to prepare for that. Um, I'm now looking at the future of this subject, and uh, the question I would like to raise is, where do we want to be in 20 years' time? And what are we doing to prepare ourselves? We can congratulate ourselves of, of the, project, the progress made in the last 10 years, and I think it's really incredible. But I would like to encourage uh, all of us to think of how do we get our acts together to really strengthen the EU policy in that realm. In my view, there is a need for cross-sectorial um, cross discussions on a strategic vision. We've talked about the security sector, the humanitarian sector, the cultural sector, the archaeological sector. I'm not sure these communities talk to each other, so my question would be, what is the next step so that we have a strategic vision for the next 20 years? Thank you. Thank you. That strikes me like a, a very good uh, uh, closing question. Uh, Giovanni, would you like to uh, start? Yes, what needs to be done for the next 20 so years? In, in 20 come? years from now, every peacekeepers will have been trained on cultural property protection and mm -hmm. will know the principles of the different conventions that apply to international humanitarian law. Every humanitarian responders will apply a culturally sensitive approach in rescuing and uh, helping uh, people that uh, are affected by a uh, critical situation. Uh, every custom agent uh, will uh, have uh, at his fingertips the database with every object in every collections of the world. Every museum will have done its, uh, its catalog and its <laughs> inventory. <laughs> UNESCO and ECOMOS will be funded. <laughs> and uh there we are. That is the vision and it's being yes. written down by uh, uh, Christa G G Gustafsson. Yes. yes, that's what you're working towards. Yes, and uh, people will be aware. And the people will be aware, for example, that uh, buying uh, an ancient object is not just any act. It's um, problematic, to put it you know, uh, mildly, uh, uh, because it is associated with blood crimes. So it's not a good thing to do. Gentlemen, would you like to add anything who's, uh, to you, Giovanni, who's become your spokesperson uh, <laughs> for the next uh, 20 <laughs> years? <laughs> the vision. How should it be in an ideal world? Yes, Mark. I, th I think um, you, you mentioned something extremely important when you said this is a transsectoral endeavor. And I absolutely agree, but um, how do we actually stage this transsectoralism? And I think this is something that needs to be answered over the next years. We must not forget that we need additional knowledge to arrive at the point that uh, Giovanni has just described. We need to bring together the different sectors. And that, for me, in essence, is also a research question, uh, which means that we probably do need research money in that area because this new sector of cultural heritage research or research for culture is something that is just forming and that is an emerging field and that probably needs financial support and also epistemological foundations. So we need to think about how we're doing this. How can law enforcement and ancient studies people work together? This is not easy and I speak from my own experience. So we need to create the knowledge base 
for being able to protect cultural heritage more efficiently and to address all the different levels that we've talked about, civil society, awareness raising, uh, law enforcement and institutions. So I'm very much in favor of thinking about research funding in this area that fosters and promotes transdisciplinary and transsectoral research designs. And I'm also very much in favor of thinking of how we can increase capacities at universities in Europe because we need more university programs in this field. There are very, very few university programs where you can be taught to become a specialist in cultural heritage protection just because it's multidisciplinary. So that could be a policy issue as well to look at how can we um, increase the capacities at universities and within university program to create the knowledge base for a new emerging field that we're witnessing right now. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you. I am going to stop the Q&A just because I'm aware that uh, you need coffee, uh, you need <laughs> to take a bio break, and you need to come back for information about the Global Cultural Leadership uh, Program. Uh, and of course, you could ask all these questions to our panelists. Um, I think, Marcus, that had a sense of a closing remarks that you were, you were making uh, there. there. Um, Walter, um, 30 seconds closing remarks, Toshiko and Giovanni, and then that's all that stands in the way of you and your bio break and coffee. Giovanni. Uh, okay. Sorry, Walter. Sorry, yeah. To, to this already long list, I would add that um, in two years, 20 years' time, people should feel pride also for the cultural heritage of other people, other nations, other countries, not just of their own. Because at the end of the day, all these things will only happen if there is enough political pressure, and the political pressure can only come from the bottom, from the people themselves. Thank you, Toshiko. Oh, three points. In 20 years, I hope that the United States will come back to UNESCO. First of all. <laughs> 20 years, 20 Maybe two. <laughs> before, that, before, that, before 20 years. The second, a bit of luck. Before, before 20 years, in the other two, two, 2030, this is the Sustainable Development Goals. And I hope that uh, the, the, the heritage conservation is not only freezing the status quo, but for the future. This sort of uh, new concept approach would be widely understood. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your very pertinent questions. Uh, please do go and grab a coffee and come